Good morning, everyone. <laughs> okay. In the book of Psalm 118, um, I'll just read one or two scriptures that says, it says, the Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. And I'll stop there. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. He has made his light to shine upon us. And that scripture says the light shines in darkness. Amen. And the darkness cannot comprehend it. We're reminded by God's word in the book of Isaiah chapter 10, 27. It says, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed and the yoke shall be destroyed. Not just broken, now a new English translations, but it will be destroyed. It will not be mended, it will be destroyed. And the beautiful thing is that this is not being done by us, it's going to be done by the anointing of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is here. Before you came, he was already here, waiting for us. He is God all by himself. And that's why we're describing as omniscient one omnipresent, present in every place, including hell. He sees everything, he knows everything, understands everything we are going through. And this morning, I want to trust, according to his word, that the light will shine upon us and darkness will dissipate and that the burdens we bear, whatsoever they may be, no matter how varied, convoluted, difficult, whatever it is, no matter how long it has lasted, that that burden will be destroyed. That's one of the reasons why we come to the, to the tabernacle. We come to the temple to worship him. We come to the temple to receive also relief. And if that's what you're here for, I can tell you that from his word, he says he will bring relief. Because he says upon Mount Zion, there will be liberty. So irrespective of whatever we're going through, I believe God for liberty this morning. Liberty from everybody in the name of Jesus. Our Father and God, we just bless you and worship you. Thank you for bringing us to this last Sunday of August. We thank you for your majestic presence over this family. You have been wonderful. There have been many difficult times, but Lord, you have been there all along. We are grateful that you are not phased by these things. We are grateful that you are God all the same, all the time. And Lord, we come to you because you are our God. You are our King. You are our Father, our Lover. You are our beautiful one. The only one we can look up to and we are enlightened. You are the one, oh God, who knows how to fill the gaps in our lives. It's you we come to this morning in praise of your holy name. We come to hold your hands and worship you for the things you have done. But we also come to seek your face with respect to the very things that we are going through, Lord. And we thank you that, Lord, even when we don't know how to put them in words, you are able to get through to us. So get through to us in ways only you can. Show up, oh God, as mighty. We give you that permission. Flow in this service. We hand it over to you, oh Lord. Speak through us, sing through us, touch through us. Let it be all about you, oh God. Be glorified all through this service. Let your light shine in everyone's darkness. Enlighten everyone's room enlighten everyone's life oh god turn around the difficult circumstances wipe away every secret tears let someone live here oh god emancipated let people live here strong happy joyful lord we thank you because we can't put everything in words but you who knows the thoughts we have in our various seats and everyone who is listening to us through the airwaves Lord, we ask, oh God, that you will do beyond what we can put in words. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you. We welcome you. We welcome you here. We thank you, Jesus. We just thank you and we bless you. Thank you, our Heavenly Father. Be glorified once again. In Jesus' majestic name we pray. Amen and amen. All right. Can we... Let's shoot. Should we stand together? You are here.
moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are a way maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. some of you today, you just need a reminder of that today, that God is a miracle worker, that God is the way maker, that he is the promise keeper, light in the darkness. That's the God we're worshipping. We're not worshipping some God who we hope will listen to us at some time, but we're worshipping the creator of the universe, the one who can do more than you can imagine, the one who's working in ways that you can't imagine behind the scenes. So we're just going to sing just the first verse again and the chorus. And as we sing this through, I want you to make this your prayer today. I want you to declare this today. Even if you don't feel like it, God is moving here. Even if you don't see it, God is moving here. God is the way maker today. You are here. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are here. 
Praises to God. Express your praise to Him. You are the way maker. You are the promise keeper. Thank you for keeping your promises. Thank you. That's who you are. My way maker. My promise keeper. My light in the darkness. My light along the paths of life. Thank you for being my champion warrior, my champion lover. Thank you for being, oh God, who you are. I love you, Lord, with all my heart. I love you, Lord. Your eyes are beautiful to behold. I love you, Lord. So sweet to be in your presence. I love you, Lord. For your sweets wrap around me, oh God. I love you, Lord. Thank you for your glorious light, your fire all around this place. I just love you, Lord. I just love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Oh, my word. For sure, I've got nothing new. How can I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often. Wow. 
except for our hearts singing hallelujah, back to him. Lord, I throw up my hands and I praise you again and again. And all I've brought is hallelujah. I wish I had more to give, but this is the words that come true. Hallelujah. 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 To the worst times in my life, hallelujah. To the best times in my life, hallelujah. Is the hallmark of Christianity that in all things, at all times, that you're able to stand in the place of worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Out of the depths of my pain, hallelujah. Out of the depths of my loss, hallelujah. Hallelujah simply means praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let the name of the Lord be glorified, hallelujah. In my tears, hallelujah. In my pain, hallelujah. Though my body a big, hallelujah. Though my heart aches, hallelujah. Even if the earth moves, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Hallelujah. Lord to move on in the service. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus majestic name we pray. Amen. You can please be seated. I sense God's amazing grace here and uh, one of these days we'll come to worship and I'm, uh, I'm sure we had our plans isn't it? But the plans were quickly ripped up and I uh, I'm trusting God that one of these days will come through and the Lord would really rip it off. <laughs> and, and I will just give way and allow the Lord to just do exactly what he wants to do. Because we, 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 we spend time, you know, sometimes trusting God to do and say, have your way. And then we come in and stay on the way. Yeah. You know, and we allow him a bit of the way and then the other bit we say, mm, let, let me just handle the wheels here, Lord. But... Uh, very quickly this morning, we, I want to invite uh, Brother Bill to speak to us about um, compassion for a few minutes before we progress and then we, we flow into the other announcements. Brother Bill. Okay, thank you for the opportunity um, to speak about compassion again. It's a few years since I last did it, and we, we had quite a number of people who took on sponsoring a child in one country or another. I mean, the, the compassion organisation covers the world, really, and they have um, centres in England, of course, in America, Africa, India, Far East, all sorts of places. And the idea of compassion is that they 
find children that are in poverty and they give them to the sponsor's donations, education, food, and uh, teaching on the Bible, and all sorts of things like that, housing as well. So um, it, it's quite, what can I say, a difficult thing in some respects uh, to explain everything that Compassion do do. Um, I've been sponsoring a little girl for some time now, but let me give you some idea of what might happen if you take on sponsorship. The adult, the, uh, I say up the price, that sounds a bit stupid really, but the sponsorship now is just over a pound a day. And, and for that, the things that they do for the kid uh, and the family generally is quite amazing. Um, the first little girl I had was in 2006. She was called Rosemary, lived in Honduras. And because she moved out of the area of where Compassion was working, uh, the sponsorship for her just dropped. It had to drop. Another young girl that I had after her uh, called Rosemary. No, that was Rosemary, sorry. Angelica, that was it, 2008. I had her, and the area that she worked in, they just stopped supporting Compassion. I don't know whether they couldn't get enough workers or just what it was, but she had to drop out of the thing as well. Uh, so one moved into a different area altogether, the first young girl, so they couldn't cover it. This one dropped out because of being no compassion there uh, in that area. Yeah. Little girl I've got now, well, I say little girl now, she's 17, but the girl I had in 2008, um, sorry, 2013, is called Natalie. She's now... To, well, you work it out, 2013 till today, she's um, getting on a bit, I suppose, for, for a kid. She, she's a young lady now who has found a job working in the local chemist preparing prescriptions, which is a bit weird, but there again, somebody has to do it. Um, and she's been there for quite a while in, uh, in East Indonesia. Um, what else can I say? She's got two sisters, uh, lives with her parents, and that's about it. So generally, compassion is giving sponsorship to a child who will write to you pretty regularly. Uh, and if you're rich enough, you can actually go and visit them after you've been sponsoring for a while. I, d I don't fancy traveling to East Indonesia, because that's a heck of a way. Um, but that again, I keep on communicating with letters. Um, on the brochures, brochures over there on the table, there are five that are children who are urgently needing sponsorship. In front of that is a leaflet that explains all about compassion, but there's no application form inside it. And there's another set of leaflets that do have application forms inside them. Uh, I'm not asking you to fill them out today because you may need to pray about it and decide whether it's something that you can do. So the, the th uh, leaflets and everything will be available next week, but uh, if you want to just come up and read them, uh, uh, unless you, you feel really led to sponsor one of the ones where you've got a picture, the others are uh, just the letter, if you like, the application. Um, so thank you very much. Um, if you want to read the magazine, I've, I've left a copy there of the magazine that they send every six months, I think it is, uh, just to inform you of what's going on. And if you access to the internet, compassionuk.org, you'll find out all about it. Thank you very much. Do encourage you to find out some more um, about Compassion there. I was reading a book, um, Brighton has written a book he's going to share when he comes back, and I'm reading it this week. And you find out about how a lot of young people around the world, um, they can't even pay, they can't have education unless you pay for it. I remember a friend of mine telling me about Zimbabwe years ago, and she said in school, the first day of school, they said, right, they read out a list of names, and said, right, these are the children, your parents haven't paid the fees, so go home until your parents have paid the fees. 
So we take it for granted, don't we, what happens in England? So if you're able to make a difference in a child's life, I encourage you to have a look. Don't take those pictures away without Bill's permission, okay, afterwards, because um, we want to make sure they're sponsored. But um, you make a big difference. You might be like me and Amy, when we started doing Compassion, we found the best holiday destination. <laughs> and we said, oh, we've quite fancy Dominican Republic, that sounds good. Okay, or you can put different reasons for what might catch why you want to sponsor the kids. But fi to find out more from Bill about their sponsorship money goes to their medical care, um, their uh, spiritual care, their education, the full, wham the full whammy. So if you want to find out more, go and chat to Bill. A couple of announcements um, to bring you, and I hope you get these dates right. So I think it's the 9th of September, which is Friday the 9th of September, Richard Twist's funeral's here. And then on the, is it 14th, Michelle? Right here to here. Michelle's putting them out. I think it's when? Friday the 8th, sorry, not the 9th. So, okay, there we go. I'm, that's, that's so good. Wednesday the 13th. That's what Michelle's sitting there. Okay, is Graham, Wednesday the 13th is Graham Charlesworth funeral here in the morning as well. So if you keep checking your emails, You'll have more information about that. If you're not on email with us, get yourself an email with us. Okay, go and see Michelle at the front here. We'll see Kim, give us a wave. Kim, give, give us a wave, Kim. There we go, having a chat there, terrible. <laughs> so you see Michelle or Kim, and they'll get you all sorted out um, with it. We've also got um, next joint, um, in a couple weeks time, on the 10th, I'll get the right date this time, 10th September, we have Tough Talk coming in to share. For those of you who know Tough Talk, um, they're the guys, big weightlifters, they make me look pathetically weak, okay? And they, the guys, amazing testimonies of what Jesus has done in their life. And they're coming in to share. So because they're coming in for the weekend to share, on the Saturday evening, we're going to do a curry night here on Saturday the 10th of September with Tough Talk are going to... Sh it's the 9th, there we go. I'll get the right date in the end. <laughs> look at your calendar and say, what's the closest Saturday? And put your finger on and go for it, okay? This is why I don't do the announcements. I told you, so I don't do announcements. There we go. You've got to hear me preach in a minute. Um, okay. But on the 9th, there we go. We're going to have a curry night here. It's free. Bring some friends along. I encourage you that night. What we don't want when we're doing these curry nights in church is just the Christians come together, just for a little holy huddle. We want this to be a chance you can invite people along. These guys are absolutely superb um, when they come in and share their story. And then I'm gonna share more about later, but later on in, I'm not giving you dates yet, not because I've forgotten them, because we're just confirming a few information. But um, in the, I think it's the third week in September, we're going to be having a week of prayer. So there's no first weekend of prayer stuff this month. But as a church, we believe God wants us to pray um, because that's what God's called the church to do. And sometimes our prayer life involves this, Jesus, please can you give me Mercedes Benz, amen. Or Jesus, I've got a job interview later, can you give me that job? Jesus, my kids are being naughty. Could you do something with them? Jesus, can you do this? And actually, if you look, those prayers are great, okay? You can pray those prayers if you want to. But actually, there's a desire when the Holy Spirit moved in the book of Acts. They met together and they prayed, as Chima shared earlier, God, have your way. Amen. They sought him and they prayed. So we're going to be having a week set aside, joining Elam nationally in here, where we're just going to pray. So I want to remind you that more information next week or so is going to come out about that but it's a great chance for us just to really pray as a church and push in. And you might have personal needs that you need to pray for that week. Give them to God, because we sung earlier, he is a way maker, miracle worker. Does anyone believe that? Yes. Sometimes we don't. And you know, I'll just share a little testimony just for myself. Okay, um, first decision, Jesus, we, we, we went away camping a couple weeks ago with the young people. I'll share more in a moment. But we went away camping, and my wife Naomi, she went, um, oh, Jim, I, I know what'll happen. She said, um, said, they'll do an appeal in the kids' ministry, and little Bethany, our youngest, will put her hand up, and they'll be like, I give my heart to Jesus. She said, Sophia will think about it, and probably won't react. That's my oldest daughter. She's 11, she's going to high school. And we sat in a meeting, and we've been praying for her, because the reality is, my daughter was hitting 11, hitting 11 years old, going to high school. I want her to know Jesus personally. Does any other parents know that feeling? We've been sharing, she jokes about the fact that she wants any Christian book her dad will buy for it straight away, no matter what the cost is. And we prayed, and we prayed, and throughout the week, she started to engage a bit more, she took notes, she listened in the sermon, she's like some of you, she hates singing, okay, and so she sort of endured the singing and listened to the message. The last night, she turns and looks at me, and she goes, um, and the person said, tell the person next to you why you're a Christian. And she goes, well, I'm a Christian because my parents took me to church. And I was like, oh, okay. I said, you know what? That doesn't make you a Christian. I said, you need to actually accept Jesus for yourself. 
She goes, yeah, but I just go to church because you make me. And she was a bit grumpy that day. Gave the appeal at the end. She, when no one said anything to her. She legged her to the front and gave her heart to Jesus. Came home, downloaded the app on her phone, and has now been reading the Bible. It's a great thing. Sophia, take your headphones out. I'm reading the Bible. Okay. You know what? She's 11. And then I saw some of the other young people in the church. It would be fair of me to pick them out because my daughter gets picked on because she's my daughter. Um, but we saw young guys engage with Jesus. And that was my prayer. God answers prayers. Even the most stubborn young, young person. You know what? That's the first decision. I believe in many decisions she'll make for Jesus. My wife made a decision at that age and she's still walking with Jesus, however many years later. And I believe in the power of prayer, okay, to do stuff. And I could share testimony after testimony, share some later about prayer. So when we have this week, don't think that's for the prayer warriors. This is for you. Say to the person next to you, prayer's for you. Prayer is for you, so let's really go for it. So before I share though, should we stand together? Let's stand on our feet. We're going to just worship God a couple of songs and we'll take up our offerings now as we sing. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. You never change. You never fail, O oh God. And true are your promises. And true are your promises. You never change. You never fail, O oh God. So we raise up a holy to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. Yeah, we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come yes Lord what is your love and grace what is your love and grace you never change you never fail oh God cause what is your love what is your love and grace? What is your love and grace? You never change. You never fail, oh God. So we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who to come yeah we raise up holy hands to praise the holy one who was and is and is to come Yes, Lord, we do raise up hands as a sign of surrender before you, that you are incredible, Lord, that you are amazing, that you are faithful, that your promises, Father God, are yes and amen, that your promises, Father God, aren't void, Lord, but they're true. And Lord, I pray as we come around your word now that you would keep that, en that enthusiasm for you going, Father God, you keep that praise for you going, Lord. And I pray, Lord, as I share, God, it won't be my words that are being shared to you, uh, shared today, Lord, but it'll be your words that are speaking through me, Jesus. We pray that in your precious name. Amen. 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 Please take your seats. Yes. 
and John's from Ember, and you was another announcement. Men's breakfast on the 16th of, of I've got the right date there, haven't I, John? Good, 16th of um, September, and it's going to be at the Maidley Center down the road there. Somebody encourage you, speak to John afterwards, um, just a reminder there, and just sign yourself up. Um, we're going to be sharing about sort of taking that forward and what it involves. Brilliant. So um, I want to share today about prayer. I nearly started preaching, given the announcements there. And um, I just want to say to the person next to you, listen in for the next 20 minutes. Okay, I know it's bank holiday. I know it's holiday mood. Some of us are still there. We're going to get there. We're going to do. And as I shared, in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to um, be looking at prayer and spending some time just praying. So for the next two weeks, for me sharing both here and at our other congregations, I'm going to be sharing three messages so the f- about prayer, what I believe just some stuff for us. To, it's really important to remember. So we're going to talk about prayer being sacrificial. We're going to talk about just how do we do prayer, spending time with God. And we're also going to be looking at the subject of fasting as well, because I think fasting is something that we've forgotten about. And those three things were three things that were really, really, really important that Jesus did them. And Jesus calls us to follow his example about how to live and how to do prayer. Now, three weeks ago, um, I was at the Limitless Festival at, uh, in, uh, what to call it, down in Stafford, which was the Elam National Festival. And it was one of those moments where I was absolutely um, blown away. There was four to 5,000 young people in a cow shed worshiping Jesus. And I was just, it was, I've been to a lot of these events the last few years um, as a pastor and as a youth pastor. But there felt something different when I went away with the young people this time. First of all, I was absolutely blown away by our young people who volunteered. You know, we went away and we took about, I think it was about eight, seven or eight young people came with us, 16 to 18 year olds. And they gave up their time to volunteer to make the event happen. And for some of them, it was challenging. Okay, it wasn't easy. And it was tough. But what I was really impressed by was that they pushed through and they really made a sacrifice for God. And we underestimate that, but it was really, really important. And I was looking at them and going, I'm so proud of them, or what they achieved. Then we also, I was just blown away sitting in the meeting room with these young, four or 5,000 young people worshiping Jesus. It was 45 minutes of worship, about half an hour of words. Some of you couldn't cope with that, okay? And there were these young guys waiting, worshiping Jesus. Some of them worshiping Jesus freely for the first time, connecting with him. Some of them having a snap during the worship and listening during the sermon. Everyone was different. Then after the sermon, they stood and we waited on the Holy Spirit. No f- music playing. And we saw God move in incredible and powerful ways. Not whipped up by the music. You know when the music just plays it just right and you get that little tingle? It's none of that. And in a world that keeps telling us that Christianity was dying and is dying, I looked out at that meeting and I thought, no, he's not. Jesus is on the move. Say so to the person next to you, Jesus is on the move. You know, God hasn't finished. There's a hope. The hope is this. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And sometimes the gates of hell look like they're prevailing, but Jesus said, no, 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 no. This is not about us. This is about him. The church is personal to Jesus. It's important. And I've been around these events so many times. And this time it felt different. There wasn't a big Christian celebrity speaker. There wasn't a big Christian celebrity worship leader. In fact, the guy who leads Elam Youth, people just refer to him as the guy with the beard. Like that's your reference. And there was just something different about it. It was felt to me like it was about King Jesus and all about him. And in fact, there was a chorus that was sung, which sort of became the anthem of the week. And this is the chorus. All hail King Jesus. All hail the Lord of heaven and earth. All hail King Jesus. All hail the Savior of the world. 
Now, guys, I know some of you get a bit cynical as we get older in life, don't you? And for me, that moment when I saw a bunch of teenagers, you know, when I first took young people to camp, I was a teenager myself. Okay, the first time around this trip, I was 21 years old. Now I'm sitting there going, I've got a blinking daughter in the youth group. Okay, I feel old. There was something amazing and powerful about no music, young people, hands in the air, singing all hail King Jesus. And I'm like, wow, something is happening amongst the next generation more than we realize. And it is our job, my job as a pastor, and it's our job as Christians to make sure that we harness this and we take it forward. It's our job to try and encourage our young people to grow. You know, I was reminded when I was at at that event about a prophecy by a guy called Steve Upple. He spoke here a couple of times years ago. He's a pastor based in Wolverhampton. And about 12 12 years ago, maybe longer, he had this prophetic word that there was going to be fires starting up all over the United Kingdom. There wasn't going to be one person. It wasn't going to be like a celebrity, but God was just going to be moving amongst his church. And he talked about this nameless and faceless people that God was going to use in incredible ways. And as I looked out upon this event, I just got the sense of that prophetic word coming true. That fires were, spiritual fires were starting up across the country. And God was moving in ways that we couldn't imagine. And it wasn't about the big celebrities. It wasn't the focus on the pastors. It was the focus on the people of God just rising up together. Isn't that amazing to see? I want to see this. You know, I'm from a church that probably had the biggest, one of the biggest speakers in Africa. Because I know about the celebrity stuff, and some of that stuff can be okay if you've got good guys with it. But I think God is really calling us as a church, not just here, but across the churches, to a place where everyone, from young and old, are ministering and are doing incredible things through the power of the Holy Spirit. Does anyone want to see that? Some of you do. Some of you are like, oh, I don't want the Holy Spirit to use me. Blinking at He's going to use you, okay? And I believe this is what he's going to do. It's that one of my non-negotiables as a leader is I don't want the church or any one person to be above everyone else. You'll often refer to me. I always call the team. Okay, I love it when people write now and they write thank you cards for stuff. And they say thank you to the team in Silverdale. I'm like, yes. They're getting it because we're all called to minister together. But the way that it's going to happen is by all of us seeking and praying, seeking God together. Having that desire. You know, someone once said that Christians want the pastors and the elders to be the good Christians that they can't be. Some of you are going, well, it's not true. We want the pastor to be the one praying on his knees 24-7. Go for it. You want that because we can't do it. But actually, you know what? It's about all of us praying together. But there's kind of a problem with God using a nameless, faceless generation of people who just everyone being used is this. Is that all of us have a deep desire to be noticed. All of us have this desire to kind of to want to be a bit famous to everyone to say, oh, That's that person coming in, the building. I read some research the other day, and it says this. People will stay longer in a job if their boss is horrible to them and is really discouraging to them than if their boss ignores them. If your boss never talks to you, you're more likely to leave your company than if your boss gives you negative feedback every day. Why? Because your boss notices you. Some of you are going, that's not me. Yeah, you might hold on. It's an animal instinct. You know what? I just find it really funny how we just we want everyone to know everything about us. We want to be noticed. You know what? There's, if we didn't have a culture of people wanting to be noticed, we wouldn't have Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. My children, all they want is YouTube channel and this sort of thing. And Oh, look at Instagram and Facebook. We just want to tell the world about everything in our lives. You know, I've got most of the stage of pausing it. I was about to put a picture on about me going away on holiday. And I put it up, and I was like, well, that's quite a good picture of me. It's a good angle. There's not many of those about. Okay, I'll put that online. 
And as I was about to put it on, my daughter goes to me, because I challenge my kids about social media quite a lot. She goes, Dad, why are you putting that picture online? I thought, I'm putting that picture online to say, I got this really nice photograph of me on top of a mountain overlooking this lake. It was a really, really good photo, okay? I mean it. Um, what I did is I spotted this photographer, and I said, can you take the picture for me? And it was really good. The reason I wanted to put that online was people to look at me and go, oh, that's very nice, Jim. Why? Because we have that desire in each and every one of us. We all fight that desire. We want to be noticed. We want to be seen. We want the pastor to notice us. We want our boss to notice us. We want our friends to notice us. We want our family to notice us. It's inside of us. Why do young men join gangs? They often join gangs because they're from families where um, they're not noticed. They sort of dismiss parents are working or a mere parent maybe not be at home. And they join a gang because they feel special. They feel noticed. Why do people get into bad relationships? Because they feel desperate to be noticed. And the problem is, with our desire to be noticed, we try and climb the ladder and we try and get seen. We've seen it in the news recently, how many church pastors have fallen because their desires to be famous and they've compromised along the way. The reality is when we get noticed, we get a dopamine hit. A chemical process goes off in our brain and we feel good. And when someone clicks like on our Facebook profile, we go, oh, yes, that's good. When someone makes you feel special or validate you, validates you, it makes you feel good. And this happens in church. We feel great when we're noticed, but when we're not noticed, we feel like nobody cares. And this is a fight between our spiritual flesh and ourselves, our spirit and our flesh. Our spirit knows that God notices us. But if no one else notices us, we think our flesh tells us that God doesn't care. And it's a struggle in our prayer life because for some of us, in our prayer life, if others aren't validating us, God can feel silent. There's a quote I read not long ago. And I've not been able to forget this quote. And it says this. People are not comfortable with God in their lives. They prefer something less awesome, more informal. Something, in fact, like a pastor. Reassuring, accessible, easygoing. People would rather talk to their pastor than to God. And so it happens that without anyone actually intending it, Prayer is pushed to the sidelines. Now, you're going to say, this is not me. Never, pastor. I read this one. Oh, my goodness. There's a challenge not just for me, but for all of us. I think this could be people who prefer to talk to anyone else rather than God at times. Because sometimes we want to be so noticed that when we encourage, say, when we pray, Prayer becomes more about other people noticing us than about us actually wanting to connect with God the Father. Isn't that true? Some of you are nodding. Some of you are feeling uncomfortable. That's okay. That's good. And I wonder, just this wonder in my heart here, do we sometimes share things for prayer, not because we want other people to pray, but we want to make feel that we're not alone, so we want validation of other people saying that they're praying for us? I wonder sometimes in moments when we are irritated, are we irritated that other people are getting more prayer than us? Not because we think that more prayers will give more breakthrough, but because we think the other person's been noticed more than we've been noticed. You know, as Christians, it's important that we make sure that we don't get stuck in the trap of using prayer as a way of validating each other and making ourselves feel better. But instead, that we use prayer as a weapon for this God has called it to be. But if we, I believe, if we're going to use prayer how God intended it to be, and not something to make just us feel good, then it's going to take us 
to be sacrificial in our prayer life. Prayer is not, it's not an optional extra for those who you've got a bit of spare time. Prayer needs to be something that we sacrifice and do. And I just want to share just briefly from John chapter 3. So if you're following in your Bibles, pull out John chapter 3, verses 22. And I want to just look at some things in our lives that maybe we need to realign in our prayer life. And this is what it goes. John chapter 22, chapter 3, verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciple went out to the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and he baptized them. Now, John was, always, was also baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water and people were coming to be baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one who you testified about. Look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. Now, I want to give you a quick summary of what's going on here. John the Baptist is baptizing people in one place. Jesus is baptizing other people in another place. Jesus seems to be baptizing more people than John. So John's disciples are going, hmm, John, why is Jesus baptizing more people than you? And they're getting a little bit irritated. And then the little rumors start. You know how it works? Well, that church is getting more people. It must be because they're compromising on the gospel. Okay. And I think John's, John's disciples are probably feeling this way. And they're getting a little bit jealous. And they start questioning Jesus' theology. So this is Jesus' cousin, it's disciples who point in the way to Jesus, and they're now questioning Jesus' the his theology because more people are going to Jesus. And I wonder if John's disciples were worried that Jesus was eventually going to take all the eyes and John was going to be forgotten about. They wanted John to be needed. If John was needed, he'd be the focus of the attention. Then they would be in return. Also notice, because they were John's disciples. They, wanted this, they didn't want the spotlight to leave them. And I think this is sometimes a little bit like our prayer life. Sometimes we don't like to lose the spotlight. But I like John's response. This is what John the Baptist said. When they come up to him and say, look, Jesus is getting more baptisms than you. He says this, a person can only receive what is given to them from heaven. Can we say that together? A person can only receive what is given to them from heaven, which is going to lead me to my first point. When we pray, we need to sacrifice our dependence on man's validation. Can we say that together? We need to sacrifice our dependence on man's validation. You can only receive what is given you to you from heaven. If it's more important for you to ask others to be prayed for rather than you to pray, then you've got an issue in your life. Sometimes we turn around and we go, please, can you pray for this situation? Please, can you pray for this? And sometimes I want to turn around and I go, can you pray for it? Can you pray for it? And sometimes it's code for, when you say, can you pray for this? It's code for, I'm struggling with this issue in my life. Now, we've had so many times in our lives as a family where I've been ready to share something and say, can you pray for me? And I felt challenged by God to say, Jim, pray for it yourself first. Don't just share so that people can think you're great or you've got needs. Because what I need comes from God and not what comes from other people. You can only get what you get from heaven. Now, a few years ago, my youngest daughter, Bethany, she's now eight years old. But she, from a young age, she had a really weak chest. So she was always coughing. And she went to the doctor and the doctor noticed the cough. And he says, I want to get her checked out. He said, something's not right with her. So we went and she got her checked out and she went to the consultant. The consultant called her a happy wheezer. He said she's too young to diagnose with asthma. But he said it's a bit like baby asthma. 
So we're going to give you an inhaler for her because she's struggling to breathe at times. And so you have the inhaler. Those of you who've had children with inhaler, you get this fancy contraption. You stick it on their face, and you're trying to fight with them, and they're wrestling with you because they don't want it. And at that, during that time, though, we had other people around us, and they were a little bit of those, you know those people who always want the attention? It's really annoying, aren't they? They've got a sore toe, and you think their toe's going to be chopped off, okay, you're amputated, or something small's going on in their lives. And we had these people quite close to us, and they were like this. And I remember Naomi turned around, and she said, Jim, she said, our kid is iller than their situation. And then they're going on about, look at us, look at us, please pray for us, this is happening, pray for it. And Naomi was about to turn around and go, you know what, can you pray for our daughter? And the reason Naomi said that was because Naomi wanted to say that at least. Because she wants, she said, you know what, they're getting all the sympathy. I want the sympathy instead. How many of you have ever thought that? Yeah, if you're not putting your hand up, you're lying. Okay. At that very moment, God said something to her. And Naomi's not one of those who always feels that God says something to her. But God said to her this. She said, by you going on about this and you making it about Bethany being well and trying to go for the sympathy, you are taking ownership of the asthma that Bethany has. Now, we're not stupid about this. We're not those parents who go and throw away medication. But Naomi, in that very moment, she decided not to make a big deal about Bethany's breathing problems. But she said, God, I'm going to trust you. Now, I've shared before about my, young, my oldest daughter getting healed from a clicky hip. We believe in healing. So we prayed. We prayed. We prayed. And we didn't make a big deal to get the sympathy for ourselves, even though at times it was really hard. Okay, we wanted the sympathy. Do you know what happened? My daughter used her inhaler one more time. I know children can grow out of asthma, and I'm fully aware of that. We didn't go throwing a medication away. We kept her inhaler with us. But God healed our daughter. Sometimes it would have been easier to get the sympathy for ourselves. But in that moment, we knew it wouldn't have been right. We needed to trust. We needed what came from heaven, not what came from man. It's great to have everyone's sympathy and everyone going, oh, you okay? Oh, we love you. Oh, we pray for you. It's great to have that. It makes you feel really good. But you don't need what man's got. You need what God's got. So the first thing we need to do together, guys, as a church, as individuals, we need to sacrifice our dependence on man's validation. Don't ask for prayer because you want everyone else to be sympathetic to you. Ask for prayer because you want God to answer that prayer. There's some Christians who don't actually want God to answer their prayers. They just want the sympathy. Don't bother asking for prayer, okay? Okay. If that's the case, because you need what God needs. The next thing we need, we need to sacrifice our insecurities. Let's say that together. We need to sacrifice our insecurities. When it comes to prayer, we need to sacrifice our insecurities. This is what John said in John chapter 3, verse 28 to 29. He goes on, John the Baptist. He says, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, But I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friends who attends attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. John the Baptist had nothing to prove. John the Baptist had nothing to prove. He knew Jesus was the Messiah. So he was a little bit like, hey, guys, Jesus is the Messiah. Why do I need to be insecure? Isn't that true? You don't have to worry about the Jesus is the Messiah. Sometimes prayers are like trying to really, really impress people. But John wasn't insecure about prayer. He wasn't insecure about Jesus. He was joyful that he knew Jesus. He was joyful that the Messiah had come. It was about Jesus and not about him. So John didn't care about the credit because it was all going to go to Jesus. And he wasn't insecure. You know what? Prayer isn't about us. It's about Jesus. 
Can we say that together? Prayer's not about us. It's about Jesus. Guys, you, when you go to a prayer meeting, you know, sometimes you go to prayer meetings and some people are determined to put every little bit of theology they know into the prayer. And you're sitting in the end going, what are they praying about? What they're doing is they're trying to show off through prayer. I've done that many a time. Okay. Do you know what I hate? I like to keep prayer short and simple. And sometimes as a pastor, you go into meetings and you get these pastors and they start praying. They blab and grab. They do every single thing going. They quote every single verse in the Bible about a subject. They do all this other stuff. And then they say, Pastor Jim, you're not praying. And I'm like, God, please can you heal them? Amen. And there's been times when I've elongated those prayers, not because I felt like I, need, uh, that I needed to pray those long words, but because I thought, Jim, you look like a pathetic Christian compared to that person, so at least make it longer to sound more impressive. You've all done the same. Don't, don't pretend you're not. Some of you haven't even prayed a prayer because you've been so insecure about the person who prayed before you. You thought, I'm not good enough. So when we pray, we need to nail our insecurities. We're coming for Jesus. He's God. He's the one who deals with it, not you. If your prayer goes wrong, it's not your fault. It's on Jesus' hands. Because sometimes we don't get because we don't ask. That's what it says. Because we're too insecure to ask. Guys, we need to nail our insecurities. It's a great quote by Harry Truman. It's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. When we pray as well, nailing our insecurities, sometimes we pray, Jesus, I want you to move across this land. And Jesus says, you know what, great, but I'm going to use the Methodists across the road. And you go, no, 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 that's what I'll pray, Jesus. And we want to get the credit over here. I've got my, my insecurities. If I pray and they get the blessing and not me, I look like they've got more faith than me, but I prayed the prayer. No, we need to nail our insecurities. John was joyful because he knew who Jesus was. And he could rest in that. Guys, when you pray, don't be insecure. Be confident in who Jesus is. Yesterday, I was at a shopping center. And um, I was at Cheshire Oaks, just passing the way here from the beach. And I was outside because I had the dog with us. And so I'm sitting outside. And I watched people go past. And I sometimes watch and I saw the people who were going in and out of the designer shops who were trying to make themselves more special than they were. And I noticed one guy walking past, and he dressed very similar to me. That's my way. Okay. And he just looked like he was happy in himself. And I noticed, I don't know why I just stood there, and I thought he wasn't insecure. It felt like he wasn't trying to impress anyone. He was just comfortable in his own skin. And I said, I want to be like that. In prayer, it's not about impressing people. It's not about being insecure. It's about coming before Jesus. So we need to sacrifice our insecurities. Final thing is this. We need to sacrifice our ego. Can we say this together? We need to sacrifice our ego. John says this in verse 30. He says, he must become greater. I must become less. Prayer is about us praying. Lord, let your kingdom come on heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer can't be about us demanding our own way. Prayer is not about us. It's about us drawing close to God and saying, God, we need you. God, you are maker of heaven and earth. God doesn't need us to tell him what to do. He needs us to be prepared to trust him. You know, when Jesus was facing the cross, do you know what Peter's prayer would have been? Jesus, give us bigger swords that we can kill the Romans. Do you know what Jesus' prayer was? Lord, give me the strength to fight what's about to happen. He must increase. We must decrease. And it's in surrender that we know him more intimately. I wasn't sure if I was going to preach this message because I thought, let's get a bit more powerful. Let's pray God will move things. But actually, I think this is really important for us to know in our hearts. That when we come to pray, 
it's all about Jesus. It's all about King Jesus. It's all about him. It's less about us. The more about him. And guys, I really believe as a church, constantly, you've realized this as I've come back in, Pastor Ravin believes the same thing, that God wants us to pray. Not just fill the prayer meeting so that we can say, oh my goodness, there's pre- lots of people praying today. I'm not interested in that. We want to be a church that prays because we want to see God move for his glory, not for our own glory. To work in ways that we can't imagine. But the way it's going to happen is by us surrendering to God. Saying, God, your ways, not our ways. You must increase. We must decrease. And I just want to ask you the question now, where's your prayer life? What's, been God, what's God been challenging on this morning? Now, I've been challenged by this message. Now, I want to go past the motions of prayer being a little bit of performance, the prayer of being about um, just about making myself sound impressive, what other people sound impressive. I want prayer to be deep and intimate with God the Father. I want to see him move in ways that are greater than we've ever seen before. And I'm now at the point in my life where I want to see God the next generation. I want to see God use them greater than he's ever used me. I want to see it greater than he's ever used you. I want our prayers not to be about God, do it how you did it years ago, but God, do it how you're going to do it in the future. Help us not to be insecure to hold on to our ways, but to allow God to do what he needs to do. I want to have a deeper relationship with my Father in heaven. And I want to sacrifice my ego. I want to sacrifice my insecurities. I want to sacrifice them before him. And I want to see him move in greater ways. Guys, I just want to encourage you. I know at the beginning I put it, it's on our website, but it's also some at the front back there. We've just got some questions just to think about this week. There's a sheet of paper on the welcome table out there to ask you questions today about where your prayer life is. This is not for me to come and say, if your prayer life's really bad, come and kneel at the front. I'm not going to get to that today. But actually ask these questions. Do you ask other people to pray for you because you want the sympathy? If that's the case, say, God, I'm choose not to do that. Still ask for prayer, but ask in the right motives. For some of you, in your life, it's about saying, God, I'm stepping down my ego today. I'm choosing to put you higher than me. Not just with my words, but with my actions. Can we stand together? I just want to spend a moment now. I just want to lift Jesus up. We must decrease. He must increase. Can I ask you, just encourage you, put your hands up. It's a sign of surrender. Some of you like, I'm not surrendering. Come on, encourage you now. It's a hands open sign of saying, God, here I am. Some of you, you were already challenged by some of the words that were just spoken. And I want to encourage you as we sing the next couple of songs, as we spend some time just waiting on the Holy Spirit in a moment, I want you just to say, God, have your way in me. Help my prayer life to be focused on you and not on myself. God, I'm surrendering. God, I'm bowing down. God, I'm coming before you. Be lifted up, be lifted up, as we bow down, be lifted up, be lifted up, Lord, 
be lifted up, be lifted up. Be lifted up, be lifted up, as we bow down, be lifted up, yes Lord, be lifted up. Be lifted up, be lifted up, Lord. Be lifted up, yes, Lord, as we bow down. Be lifted up. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the nations be glad, let the whole earth tremble, for you are God. And come and worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, yes, Lord, as we bow down, be lifted up, yes, Lord. As we bow down, be lifted up. Just for a moment, I just want to encourage you. As you bow down, sacrifices need to be made. And in your heart right now, some of you, you know there's some sacrifices that need to be made to God. And I want to encourage you, just use your words before Him now and say, God, I'm choosing to make a sacrifice to you. There might be some things that you haven't got a clue. How are you going to sacrifice? You say, God, I've struggled with my insecurities all my life. God, I don't know how I'm going to do it. Don't worry about the how right now. Just worry about making that decision. Say, Lord, I'm making a sacrifice to you today. Be lifted up, be lifted up, as we bow down, be lifted up, be lifted up, Lord. Be lifted up, yes, Lord. Be lifted up as we bow down. Be lifted up. Sing that again, just gently sing it. Be lifted up, be lifted up, as we bow down. Be lifted up, oh Lord. Let's just wait on him a moment. Oh, my Savior. Oh, my Jesus. Jesus.
just a sense, and I may <laughs> go test this. The Bible always says they're praying for testing prophetic words or words of knowledge. Just feel right now, there's some people here, maybe one or two people, and there's something that you're holding on to. When I shared about Naomi and my youngest daughter, Bethany, there, there's something that you're holding on to. You won't release. You keep asking to prayer, but you don't actually want it to be answered, the prayer to be answered. There's some validation you're getting from a situation, and you, you can't release it. I just say right now, just feel free. God just says, right now, okay, now's the time to let go. Stop holding on to that thing that's not part of you. That's not your identity. Don't own it. Give it over right now. Not I'm sure what it is. Feel there's someone else as well. Maybe with headaches, you've been having headaches. A little bit of those headaches have become your identity. And I just believe God just wants to lift it. Maybe it's like a migraine in the side of your head, something really powerful on the right-hand side of your head, and it feels really sore at times. I just believe God just wants to say today, it's time to release. And if that's you, just use your own words just to say, God, please help me to release this. If you need prayer, come and find me afterwards. I want to pray for you for those headaches. something in my heart I wanted to share and I just held back because um, this is a really good culture to teach the word and I thought it was it was time I would share and it's on prayer and healing and this this last month it's been as a Christian as a person it's been horrendous not horrendous but it's been full on um, part of me, uh, I had a friend I visited, and towards the end of his life, I prayed that God would take him home, and God was merciful and took him home. And then I found out another close friend of mine, the next day, had died. And then um, I'm supposed to be retired, and people say, "Well, have you retired now?" And I said, "Yes, I." I'm kidding everybody I'm retired, but part of my job is like visiting people and I've become so professional now that I attend funerals as well. And, you know, we, not only church friends, but I've been in business for over 40 odd years, 50 years. So then your customers becomes close friends. And of course, the third generation, the first generation passes on and you have to attend because they've been your support all your life but so on this particular day the job um, I called it this lady um, because I just wanted past time and of course she said oh will you come in for a cup of tea and uh, I called in for a cup of tea and we had a chat and of course when you're that age it's always, it's always comes to health and she says um you know, I've, I've only got 40% of my kidney function. And then I just felt com 
compelled to pray for her. We're not, you know, she knows that I'm a Christian who goes to church. So I explained to her about healing. Now, it, it's such a complex um, subject. I, you know, the gains and force. Sometimes you pray, God works. Sometimes you pray earnestly and there's no answer. I can't answer for that. But we're comp- I'm compelled, if somebody is ill, to go to the word and say, look, I'm a Christian and I do believe in divine healing. And I said, whether you believe it or not, if you want me to pray for you, I'll pray for you. And so she did. But I also explained to her that when I was a young man of 17, I became a Christian. And the pastor took me to visit on a Saturday night. And there was this man in hospital and all his toes were black gangrene. And the doctors was going to chop him off on Monday morning. And Saturday night, the pastor and myself, a young man of 17, just became a Christian. And this was this bloke in hospital with his legs up, all black with gangrene. On Monday, the surgeon was going to chop chop his feet off, his legs off, his toes rather, sorry. And the pastor prayed for him. And I was just looking on, half believing, but laying hands on him. Um, And do you know what? He got healed. And that was his testimony. And I think Dave will know because it it was Mr. Copeland. And he testified that on that particular day, that particular night, a certain pastor and this Chinese boy laid hands on him and he was healed. And I related that to, to this person. Now, sometimes we pray, nothing happens. But if God lays it on your heart to pray, you be bold and pray and trust God. Now, I was in hospital. Um, well, I was shopping with Jackie and we got the phone call. And the phone call was, George is in hospital, George is my brother. And I said to Sally, we'll come round straight away. And what happened, he had, they call it a seizure. But sometimes when we become so ill, and the doc- you want the doctors to find something wrong with you, don't you? But, you know, for your own reason. Now, why have I, why have I fainted? Why have I done this? Why have I done that? So, when I went to see George, he had a CT scan, and it was inconclusive. They can't find anything wrong with him. And in the meantime, Jackie says to me, go and pray for him. And Sally was, I just laid the hands on him. I said, Lord, whatever it is, just pray that you just heal me, brother. I'm not saying he's healed, right? I prayed, and a few days later, you know, the National Health is that stretch. They couldn't give him an MRI scan straight away. He had to wait two or three days later. And two or three days later, he had the scan, and they can't find anything wrong with him. Now, I'm not saying God's healed him, but they cannot find anything wrong with him. And up to this day, he's been sent home. He's not completely well, but he's better than he was, but they still can't find anything wrong with him. But then I said to Sally, but in the meantime, we prayed for him. And sometimes we have to believe the divine as well as the medication. So he's come home and we still don't know what's why he's he's had this, um, you know, seizure. But all we can say is trust God. And if God, you know, as you become a Christian, you grow in the faith and you've got the gift of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes you have the urge to pray for, lay hands on people and pray for people. And then you have to explain to them what you believe and what they believe. Sometimes they'll say it's gobbledygook. I say, look, it may be gobbledygook, but... If you accept my prayer and you do have a healing, what have you to lose? And sometimes they weigh it up and say, oh, go on then. And and sometimes God does the miraculous 
and sometimes God in his mercy allows what he does allow. I can't give any answers. But I want to encourage you and I want to stress to you that prayer does work and it doesn't matter how, how you pray. You know, it doesn't have to be on the front, but it's in the secret place. But you have to put it into practice sometimes. And, mm. you know, I, that's all I can say. Amen. And to do that, you need to nail your insecurities. Is that right, guys? So we're going to sacrifice insecurities and go for it. We're going to go. Thank you, Gordon, for sharing that. Prayer really does work. Say to the person next to you, prayer works. Prayer works. But prayer is also a sacrifice. Let's stand. We're going to sing. And my final song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Oh, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Every trials and temptations is their trouble anywhere. We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Come, but with the load of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee. And take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms you'll take and shield thee. Thou will find our solace there. Our Father, we thank you and bless you for bringing us to the end of this service. We just give you praise for all that you have said. And we ask, O oh Lord, that your mighty presence will go with us even as we depart from this place. We ask that this week will be a most glorious week. Progress us on every side. Let our joy be full. Thank you for your mighty hand upon every home. Lord, we just ask, O oh God, that we will see wonders. We will hear good news on every side. In the mighty name of Jesus. All right. Let's, let's, let's share that, um, I think that verse... That last verse that says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow you. But this time I want you to focus on the next person beside you. And you will say, surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. And you... Okay, okay, we'll say it again. So say it to the next person beside you. You're going to say it to the next person beside you. And then when you finish that, you then say it to yourself. It's a prayer, it's a verse, but you're also prophesying. All right, surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your lives. And okay, okay, so we'll do it one more time. Remember, I'm a teacher. I said we should focus on the next person beside us, and then you were pointing to me. So, can we focus on either to the left or to the right? Again, can we do it one more time? Surely. Okay, I will take that. And now can you focus on yourself? Surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow me 
all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the presence of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Go and be blessed. Praise the Lord.